Good morning and good afternoon from Brussels. Uh, I'm Ian Lesser with GMF here in Brussels, and uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, virtual discussion on the US-EU relationship in 2021 and beyond, uh, what we can expect from the Biden administration. Um, thank you all for joining. Um, we have three uh, wonderful speakers to join us for this conversation today, and I'll introduce them in a moment. But just to say this is, uh, to say the least, an extraordinary week uh, when seen from Washington or when seen from this side of the Atlantic. Um, and there's a great expectation on both sides, I would say, for changes in transatlantic relations, which have not been easy in recent years, to say the least, uh, both in style, certainly, but also on substance. And I think we'll have a chance to talk about both of those things here today. Uh, let me say at the outset that we're really delighted to be able to do this uh, with Egmont and to thank our friends, uh, Sven, and all our friends at Egmont uh, for working with us on this. It's a pleasure to collaborate. Um, just to give you a little bit of a roadmap to what we will do, um, we'll have a, a conversation uh, among the three speakers um, to start, and then uh, we'll open it up to all of you, and you'll be able to send questions to me via the Q&A function on Zoom, please, the Q&A function, and um, we'll try to get to as many of those as we can, uh, and we'll end at 4 p.m. Um, so we're really delighted to have with us today, uh, as I say, three wonderful observers uh, to talk about this issue. Um, first, from Washington, uh, Ellen Lapson, who's Professor of International Security uh, at the, and Director for the Center of Security Policy Studies at George Mason University in Washington, um, had a very distinguished career in the US uh, government, has been a friend for many years. Ellen, thank you very much for being with us today. Um, we also have with us uh, Reinhard Budikofer, a member of the European Parliament, uh, member of the Foreign Affairs Committee and leader of the delegation on China in the European Parliament uh, and longtime friend of GMF as well. Reinhard, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, last but not least, Sven Biskop, uh, who is director of Egmont, the Royal Institute for International Relations here in Brussels, and also uh, we've done many things together. So in a way, this is not only a conversation among some excellent observers, but uh, also a conversation among friends. Uh, maybe I could start with you, Ellen, and, and ask you really the most open-ended of open-ended questions, which is to say, what, what can we expect from this new administration in terms of the relationship with the European Union? But, but maybe even if you'd like to say a word about the general approach to foreign policy and, and the world. Ellen. Well, thank you, Ian. Thank you, Ian. And it's delightful to be with GMF and with Egmont. Uh, wish I were in Brussels with you. Someday that will happen again. Um, but let me just start with um, saying that it really was a celebration of democracy yesterday, the sense of relief. Uh, so here's a, just two data points that I think you'll find of good news. Um, Biden's favorable rates yesterday were 68% of the US public. So that must include some Republicans. Um, and the Proud Boys put out that uh, Trump failed them and that he's weak. So many people are hoping that the Trump fever that, that manifested itself at the end of the Trump presidency in such a virulent and awful and frightening way, uh, maybe that fever is breaking. Maybe some of the groups that were mesmerized by him will now be at least ready to, to rethink. So let me just start with one of Trump's you know, most important messages. The truth is back, science is back. We can think logically and rationally about the challenges that face us. Uh, Susan Glasser in the New Yorker in her first letter from Biden's Washington was uh, Biden's inaugural speech was a love letter to the truth. And he kept talking about the importance of actually knowing what the facts are. So that will help foreign policy uh, because we can at least spend a little time with allies and partners around the world, just uh, assuring that we understand the problem set in, in very similar ways. Um, very quickly, you know, that Biden talked about six crises that face uh, the United States, and two of them have a deep, you know, transatlantic component to it. One is climate and the other is improving America's global standing. But I think it's important for all our friends and allies around the world to understand that Biden's 
you know, overwhelming priority is going to be some of these domestic crises. Um, even each of those domestic crises has a global dimension, the threats to democracy, the pandemic. Sure, everybody's worried about these. Everybody's faced with the acute challenges. But Biden's focus will be primarily domestic. He has a terrific team on foreign policy that can pick up where they left off four years ago, albeit with a, a, a requirement that they rethink what's the baseline. So the baseline on China has changed. The baseline perhaps on alliances and partnerships has shifted a bit. So, um, you know, I think that particularly in Europe, there sh sh must be some relief that you can have a, a, a logical conversation with the Biden team. There may not be easy agreement on some of the questions. What role does Europe play in the China threat problem set? Um, what role does, you know, are we in good alignment on climate change? And I guess I would just end with, I believe that the, uh, one of the things that Biden is signaling is other than the pandemic, polarization at home, domestic extremism, it is very much the case that climate change is going to be one of the animating principles overall of how the Biden team looks at our role in the world. So. He's got lots of firepower focused on the climate question, both in domestic and international jobs, and they're supposed to work as an integrated team. So um, I would just say that I believe that Biden strongly personally believes that climate is one of the kind of animating principles or organizing principles of international relations for the foreseeable future. Ellen, thanks very much for starting us off. And you, you give us a lot to think about. I'm sure we'll come back to those things. Um, I, Reinhard, I, I would like to turn to you, if I could, um, for your thoughts on this. Uh, you know, there's been such an intense debate in Brussels in the last years as to what would what would change transatlantic relations. And, uh, you know, there's enormous enthusiasm here, but also, in a way, also perhaps some wariness that, you know, that not everything can be reset. And, uh, and that's surely true. Uh, but, you know, eager to hear from you in terms of what you think, maybe just to mention one other thing that you might want to react to. I mean, I think it was pro it's probably accurate to say that Donald Trump um, didn't, re and people in his administration didn't much take the European Union as an institution seriously. They saw the world through uh, the lens of individual countries, even individual leaders. Um, it seems to me that on that very basic point, there will be a big difference with the Biden administration. But, but Eager to hear your thoughts, Reiner. Thanks again for being with us. Well, thanks, Ian, Ian for having me. Um, indeed, as as uh, many of us have said before, when when we realized that the Biden would really be the forty sixth president of the United States, there was a huge collective sigh of relief all around Europe. Certainly, um, and. I would go one step further and, and say there, there still is a great readiness to trust the United States to, to come back, as President Macron said uh, in, in his tweet. But um, there's also some disbelief. And you've seen that in, in several uh, terrible polls uh, that uh, have been published uh, just recently which um, clearly indicated that the standing, the, the, the kind of goodwill that the United States commands in most of the European countries has been waning uh, quite a lot. Uh, I, I do recall that uh, during the presidency of George uh, W. Bush, uh, a lot of Europeans were also very disappointed, to say the least. And then there was a new surge of uh, um, openness and, and, and togetherness when, when President Obama came in in 2009. But experiencing this fallout twice, and the second time so much more radical, being told that you're considered a foe as a European Union, that changes a lot. And I don't think that we would be well advised if we hoped that this would just sort of fade away. So we have to, to actively engage very much into rebuilding uh, this, uh, this uh, reliability. And it's not just about reinvigorating 
uh, a relationship that has served both sides of the Atlantic so well over many decades. It's also about um, the question of whether there is a way of making it stronger and in maybe even locking it in, in a way that it cannot be challenged in another four years. Quite a few people I've spoken to over the last days have said, okay, all fine with Biden. Biden's a good person, Biden's a great leader. Uh, we have a lot of trust in, in, in the administration that he is assembling, but what then, what, what, what if, what if after four years? And, and I, I hear that particularly uh, also in, in Berlin. And I, I, I think that some of the moves that you've seen from Berlin in, in the recent past are connected to this very big question mark. Um, I wanna make um, a second point on China, which as somebody has written just recently, could be considered the Archimedean point of transatlantic relations uh, in the uh, next um, number uh, of years. Um, in, in, in an article in, in Foreign Policy, a couple of Biden guys uh, 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 speculated that possibly uh, having uh, an outside opponent being challenged by China could help the United States getting back on its feet, finding a, a, a new orientation, maybe the same could hold true for the transatlantic relationship. That when we look at the way in which China as a systemic rival challenges both the EU and the United States, maybe that can help us in identifying the real priorities that we should look to. Um, I have been, as you may know, Ian, I have been, uh, not happy with the fact that the comprehensive agreement on investment was finalized just before the end of the year, just before uh, President Biden came into office. I felt it was mistaken to, to, to choose demonstrating to the US that Europe could act in a way that some people call strategic autonomy over demonstrating to China that there was a willingness and a readiness uh, between the transatlantic partners to push back against some of their aggressive policies. So I think that was just the, the wrong uh, uh, priority, uh, but still that should not uh, completely get in, in our way. And, and I think um, there are, um, uh, a lot of issues, part, in particular with regard to trade and in, 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 uh, with regard to um, international organizations, multilateral organizations, beyond being part of Paris or, or being uh, part of the WHO, also with regard to uh, WTO, the Human Rights Council, ITU. I think we've been lazy. We, uh, and, and that applies also to the European side, I would argue. We've been negligent with regard to the role of international multilateral organizations and have allowed the Chinese to have way too much influence in, in, in those institutions. And this should be a topic for uh, collaboration. My third point is about uh, the, the dimensions of uh, transatlantic re-engagement. Um, I think it will not be sufficient if just the executive branches of government get together and uh, start hashing out stuff. Uh, I would argue that it would also be important to strengthen the parliamentary level of cooperation and also other levels, societal levels of cooperation in order to possibly institutionalize a stronger relationship because without institutions, it's always a, a bit more difficult to defend an important relationship. And my final point very shortly is this. The transatlantic relationship, even if it's a love affair, is in my mind not an end in itself. It is for either side a tool to live up to the responsibilities that each of us has to shoulder with regard to the global community. Uh, when we look at the pandemic, for instance, can we help other countries better fighting the pandemic if we cooperate? 
that should be a, a question that we ask. Can we help other um, continents with uh, issues like connectivity, building their own development strategies without being debt dependent on Beijing? These kind of uh, common strategies to open the door to uh, uh, give an inviting uh, offer to, to other uh, partners in the multilateral world, that should also be at, at the core of a renewed transatlantic relationship. Right. thank you very much. Uh, you've put a lot of things on the table for us, which I'm sure we'll come back to uh, shortly. One of the things that you talked about, uh, strategic autonomy, um, is I know, Sven, something that you've thought a great deal about. Um, and you may have some other thoughts to share with us, but maybe as part of that, you could just comment briefly on that as well. Uh, you know, do you need, do you still need it with Biden? Um, certainly Trump spurred it on. Uh, we had a debate at GMF not long ago among two colleagues of mine who have very different views about this, but uh, eager to hear yours. Sven, thanks again. Over to you. Thank you, Ian, and thank you for a chance to, to co-organize this again between the GMF and, and Egmont. Um, well, I want to make three quick points and, and picking up uh, your question. I think one of my very short point is that I, I hope that the Biden administration would really talk to the EU. It seems kind of evident, uh, but a lot of attention will be focused on NATO, which has just decided uh, to rewrite its strategic concept, and, and rightfully so. But many of the topics, I would say most of the topics that we need to talk about, uh, the future of the multilateral system, the place of China in the world, um, the, the, the multilateral trade, climate change, um, those are not NATO topics. No, you can talk about anything in NATO, but you won't be able to do anything about it at NATO. So we need a direct EU-US consultation on all of these topics. Of course, this only makes sense if the Europeans act as EU. Uh, that, that, that's, the big, that's the big caveat uh, here. Now, too, on this issue of strategic uh, autonomy, the EU is, of course, a strategically autonomous player, an independent player in international politics, in the economic sphere, in the political sphere, but only to a very small extent in the security and defense sphere. And I still think it should be also in that sphere, in a way, regardless of who sits in, in, in the White House. Um, first, in the past, I had one reason, now I have two. Um, the, the one reason is that, that the US and the EU do not look at the world in entirely the same way, and they are in different geographic locations. Uh, obviously, I, I, I think that for the US, uh, the Asia Pacific has become the primary theater. Uh, Europe, therefore, has become a secondary theater, still quite important, but secondary to the to the Asia Pacific. Uh, the American combat troops are not in Europe uh, uh, anymore. Um, and and um, the, the threat assessment vis-a-vis -vis China is, is still still different. So it is logical that Europeans are should be able to deal themselves with any security problems short of Article 5 in the periphery of Europe, especially towards the South. And I would say the EU ought to take the lead of that. Um, but I think it's also necessary that even within NATO, the first line of defense, the first conventional line of defense and deterrence is European and, and should be beefed up. And that is what I would call um, strategic, strategic autonomy. I hope that maybe we can use the fact that NATO is writing a new strategic concept. At the same time, the EU is the, uh, writing a so-called strategic compass for European defense. Uh, the fact that these coincide, maybe we can use it to make some sort of bargain uh, and, and create a much clearer division of, of roles, whereby we say, OK, European strategic autonomy does not mean that we will do our own collective defense. We continue to organize that through NATO, but within NATO, that first line of conventional European defense must be able to stand on, it, on its own. Basically, we must send a signal to the Russians, even if there were no Americans present in Europe, you cannot win a short conventional war against the Europeans alone. Um, at the same time, we could say, but NATO focuses on that, and the EU will take charge of the, of the southern flank. Could this be a deal? My quick uh, third point is, is the following. Um, a lot of the debate focuses uh, indeed, uh, indeed on China. But what I hope we would not forget is that Europeans and Americans together would also think about what is our positive offer to the world, right? I think a lot of what of politics recently has focused on saying, we are not China. 
But that is no longer sufficient to mobilize third countries to work with us because China's already there. And, and, and in many ways, it has an interesting offer to them. To, so saying we're not China is not enough. We also have to think about what, which public goods do we offer to the world? What is in it for other countries if they work with us? And I hope that there we can see some progress. Thank you. Sven, thanks, thanks very much. Um, you know, when GMF has done its transatlantic trends survey, it's, it's evolved over time. But for many years, you know, uh, we ran this uh, large scale public affairs, public opinion questionnaire. And, and it, you know, one of the messages that was very clear over, you know, a decade or more of doing that work is that, you know, views on issues between the United States and Europe were driven very, very heavily by perceptions of American leadership. Who was the president? How were they seen? Uh, and, and in a very durable way, uh, you know, uh, Reiner, you mentioned uh, President Bush. Well, you know, he, despite that there were some changes in policy from one administration to the other with Bush, you know, he never recovered from those negative views that started early on in the administration. And similarly, President Obama was applauded in Europe. He remained popular with the European public until the very end, despite the fact that there were some real policy differences. The personalities really seem, the style really seems to, to matter. And I, you know, I, obviously that bears on our kind of conversation, maybe in an even more dramatic way today. But before we open it up to, to everyone who's joined us, I did want to just come back to you um, with a, a kind of question, you know, to try to dig just a little bit deeper briefly with each of you on, you know, what will be easy to do between, or easier to do between the US and the EU now? in terms of issues and what will be tougher. Um, I can make my own list of what is probably easier and things that are probably tougher, but I'd like to hear yours. So maybe if I could go back to you quite briefly, uh, Ellen, maybe starting with you. Well, none of the issues that are hard are gonna be necessarily easy, but it will be reasonable for Americans and Europeans to have serious conversations. First, we should say that some of um, you know, Biden's most senior appointments are people who have deep familiarity with Europe, who know Europeans themselves. Uh, Biden himself is extremely well known. So just getting the relationships back on track and some level of trust, I think, will help. So on my list, I would put, you know, Turkey and Iran, let's just think, it's not that they're easy problems, but there may be some alignment between European interests and American interests. I mean, Turkey really is a challenge to Western institutions of are you in or out? Uh, are you going global at the expense of your Western ties? Uh, how worried should we be about sort of anti-democratic behavior in Turkey? <clears throat> Iran, for sure, the administration wants to talk to Europe before it declares a, a tactical plan for getting back into the JCPOA. I think they've been signaling in the last few days that um, that's not going to be on the front burner. Don't expect any dramatic announcement like the, going back into the Paris Agreement that the JCPOA will be something that has to be coordinated. So I see that as an opportunity for Europe and the United States to you know, re-engage on, on serious substance. And I think there's some common ground there. I, the US has made this problem much more complicated. And uh, it's not clear, like uh, Reinhardt said, the sort of erosion of belief in America's reliability is surely true in Tehran. So in Tehran, do they care that Biden's president? They think any American president is gonna be hostile to them. So that problem doesn't get easier, but I think it's a logical one for an early dialogue between the US um, and European partners. Eastern Med, all the, the gas forum and the you know, new political economy of the Eastern Med, I would assume is something we can have you know, a, a productive and uh, you know, not contentious conversation about. And Libya, I really appreciated Sven's point about whether the Southern Rim is kind of the natural arena for the Europeans to take the lead and the US is, is an interested party, but not necessarily the lead. So how do we keep alive the you know, modest progress that's been made on resolving uh, Libya's civil war and getting some of the external actors out. Uh, so that might be another area for cooperation. Russia is gonna be really interesting because we have a lot of Russia hawks 
in the administra the Biden administration. So I do think you're going to um, have very tough language on Russia. Whether that appeals to many, if not most, European countries, I think remains to be seen. Ellen, thanks very much. Reinhard, what's what's your short list of what's tough and what or lists of what's likely to be tough and what's likely to be easier? I think you might be muted, Reinhard. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I guess it's going to be tough for a lot of people around Berlin to realize that the opposition against Nord Stream 2 was not just a crazy idea from President Trump, but that the Biden administration will stick uh, by that criticism. Uh, I, I listened in to, to the Senate hearing of uh, Tony Blinken yesterday, and he didn't mince, mince too many words on that. So um, uh, it might be tougher for us on, on several counts to realize that what we uh, may have preferred to ignore, blaming it on that unwanted person in the White House, that uh, unacceptable um, pe person who would not tell a lie from the truth, uh, that this cannot be used as an excuse anymore. So, so that we, and I believe strongly that um, the relationship will not become easier just because of what happens in Washington. If there are not similar or adequate changes around Europe, for, for instance, with regard to the willingness and ability to contribute more um, consequentially to our own common security, I'm afraid uh, we will end up with more um, difficulties than we all now hope. Um, but to, to give you a, an arena where I think a lot positive could happen, where I think things are gonna get easier, that's, that would be the trade front. Um, obviously, um, I would expect that the Biden team soon will announce that they will support the um, candidacy of uh, Mrs. Okonjo Ideala for the uh, uh, WTO post. Um, I, I have indications uh, that uh, there is a willingness to re-engage with regard to WTO reform, in particular the reform of the appellate body. Um, I would assume that the old long-standing legacy conflict of uh, 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 Boeing Airbus could be resolved within at least the first year of the Biden administration. And I would hope that also the, the unacceptable 232 tariffs that we consider illegal under WTO regulation uh, could uh, be um, um, uh, put out, out of the way. Uh, so, and, and more importantly, even with a, a strate strategic look forward and, and picking up uh, an argument that, that Swin made uh, when he said, well, we, we also have to offer the world some public goods. And I agree with that. We cannot be just the defenders of the status quo against China. We have to to move adequately to the challenges that are in front of us. There, I think, um, with regard to trade, it is interesting to take note of the fact that quite a few people in the incoming Biden team, including uh, Jan, uh, Janet Yellen or, uh, or John Kerry or Catherine Tai, uh, have an interest in, in uh, developing what could be called a strategy of greening trade turning trade into a tool for the necessary economic transformation that we all uh, look forward to. I think this is a great opportunity. I'm, I'm not expecting that we would have a TTIP 2.0. That's not going to happen. But if we can work on this agenda that I just uh, sort of roughly sketched, that would be great progress. Right. On. Thank you. Sven? Right. Um, Clausewitz said that in war, everything is simple, but nothing is easy. Uh, and I think that applies to international politics, too. But um, where I hope, in order not to not to talk on the same topics, where I hope we might see some progress is, is on vaccines, right? I think vaccination should not become a, a power play be, between the great powers. And the fact is, none of the great powers actually uh, can save the world on its own in this regard. So 
could we not at least to you as an EU coordinate on you know, what is our approach to third countries? Um, take into account, of course, that logically we try to vaccinate our own citizens first, but, but even so. Because now we're sort of, on the one hand, we've bought up all the stock of the European and American-made vaccine for ourselves. Then we complain that other countries uh, will use Russian or Chinese vaccines. Well, yeah, you can't have it both ways. So could we, could we get progress on, on, on sort of the global coordination uh, of, of the fight against the coronavirus? That, I hope, uh, would, be, uh, would be an easy one. Um, and to come back then to, to, to China, maybe, I mean, the, the conversation in Europe has shifted, uh, of course. Uh, but I still think there is a very tricky issue here and that we conflate two things. One, that we don't like or even abhor China's domestic model and politics, which that's one thing. And two, the fact that China is a great power and will stay a great power, right? And, and even an authoritarian state does have legitimate interests. Uh, doesn't always pursue them in legitimate ways. That, that's a different thing. And so um, to, to find a consensus about, you know, are we, are we, is it our aim sort of just to undo China as a great power? I don't think that's possible personally. And that, that means you're set for a rivalry uh, without end and, and a new Cold War. Or are we trying to accommodate China within the rules of the global order on the condition that they stick to, to the core rules? And can that be the basis for a joint um, transatlantic uh, approach? I think that will be very difficult also because within Europe, uh, we, we haven't quite made up our mind, uh, I think, about our position. Thanks. Sven, thanks very much. Uh, we have a, a number of questions that have come in from our virtual audience, and we'll get to at least some of those, and some of them are similar. Um, let me uh, maybe just start with a question that's come in from uh, Bart Shevchik, and I'm going to find this in this very long list. Uh, he's asking about calls for a new strategic partnership agreement, a kind of new Atlantic charter. In other words, some kind of new formal, not necessarily creation of an institution, but a new kind of declaration to adhere to the, as a kind of way to reset the relationship or reinforce it. What do you think of that? Any of you? Reinhard, perhaps to start with you. I'm not so sure what the value would be of such a document, but I'm pretty sure that the conversation about such a document might, might be very helpful. Uh, and uh, I would, rather than, than enshrining um, holy principles, um, if we could use such a process uh, to, to um, identify practical opportunities, practical deliveries, uh, I think that that would be the real, the, a good combination. Okay. Sven, what do you, what do you make of this? Mm. Necessary, useful? Of the curve, I, I'm not sure because I mean, um, sure you can gather, but, but, and you can talk and maybe decide, but who implements, right? Uh, such a council has no body behind it. Uh, what, what strikes me is that, that the EU and the US, we are very close in many ways, but there is no really structured dialogue between those two. So I would fill that gap uh, rather than create a new institution. Thank you. Um, Ian, if I could uh, come in, we do know that uh, President Biden during the campaign talked about reinvigorating democratic, you know, the bonds among democracies. And so there, I don't believe the team has decided yet whether to go small, something like the D10, or to go much broader, you know, that perhaps dozens of countries would participate. There have been experiments over the years from Clinton onward of various um, uh, you know, alliances or groups. So I don't know if you can bound it to Europe. It might have to, you know, if it were to be this revalidation of democratic principles, it might be happening in a, in a more global way, not just in a transatlantic way. Uh, but I do think that's something that uh, appeals to the Biden team. They believe it is the antidote to rising authoritarianism and populism. It, and now we are certainly on the defensive. We are not 
exactly the, the paragon of, of stable de democratic behavior. Uh, we have a lot of you know, deep, deep worries about uh, the fragility of our own democracy, but maybe that's even more a reason to have a conversation about revalidating uh, democratic values and culture. Uh, and that Europe would be a, a very central part of that, but perhaps not the exclusive part of that conversation. If you allow me, Ian, yeah, go to, ahead, Ryder, to, I suspect to, you're going to say what I was going to ask. Go ahead. <laughs> pick up that ball. Look, uh, both um, Ellen and, and Sven and also myself, we, we all have spoken about the necessity to address the rest of the world. Uh, it cannot be the... Uh, unexpressed uh, sort of uh, thinking behind uh, a revitalization of the transatlantic uh, relationship that we rally the West and forget the rest. And, and, and I, I'm a, a bit skeptical with regard to that D10 idea, because basically that's big OECD countries plus India. Where is the offer in such an idea to the rest of the world? Where is the offer to democracies maybe uh, fledgling democracies, but uh, try, uh, trying, struggling democracies. Where's the offer to, to, to other partners? And, and I think uh, the, uh, it, there's a great need uh, in, in the transatlantic relationship that we don't just use the others as a sounding board. So when I look at trade issues, for instance, we've cooperated between the EU and Japan and the US um, uh, on WTO issues with regard, for instance, to uh, illegal subsidies. Uh, uh, it cannot just be those big three cooperating. We must bring others on board. Reiner, uh, thank you for that. I actually was going to ask you a question related to that, but slightly different. I mean, will even you know, it's not even clear to me that all members of the European Union are going to be so comfortable with a democracy agenda coming from Washington. I mean, you know, <laughs> as much as as much as uh, you know, Washington has its own uh, struggles with this concept. Uh, there are some struggles going on, uh, you know, on this side of the Atlantic. Well, if if the plan is to have a summit of democracies, it might be a lonely summit. Uh, but I heard uh, a, a different rhetoric. I've I've heard uh, 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 talks about. Uh, uh, a summit for democracy, that might be more inclusive. Okay. So if I could move on, there's a question uh, from Murat Yetkin um, to, um, maybe I could start with you, Ellen, uh, it's directed at you, but others may have a thought about Turkey. Uh, you know, where you could imagine US policy going towards Turkey and, and the extent to which there can be a US EU uh, approach to Turkey. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, so I do think part of the acute issues with Turkey reside in more in the NATO forum than the EU forum because of some of the security problems that have arisen with uh, the F-35 program. So, you know, the US has a unilateral program that I think there's surprising consensus in our own defense community uh, that we have to push back on Turkey thinking that, you know, it'll always get a pass on doing things that are you know, don't conform with American policy uh, on the F-35. I think the Turkey issue is much broader about the erosion of democratic principles, the human rights situation in Turkey. Um, and so I'm assuming this will be a, a topic for coordination. Generally, I mean, and I'm, I'm saying this a little bit from the distance, not from uh, an insider perspective. I think some of the people that have been named to positions in the Biden administration are, you know, a little bit more skeptical about uh, President Erdogan and whether he is a trusted, deep, deep uh, ally or whether this is a country that is moving in a more independent direction and the US either has to adapt and accept that or push back a bit. But when push comes to shove, the United States still sees Turkey as a country of great strategic uh, consequence. And we usually turn the other cheek. We usually um, come, come around to some form of accommodation with Turkey. Many people believe that Turkey has gone in a direction that makes that harder and harder to do, of whether Turkey is making sovereign choices to be a more independent actor um, and to not rely exclusively on its Western 
uh, connections as to, to shape its foreign policy. So I think it is a, a topic that will be of great um, interest, you know, priority for US European uh, dialogues. Reiner, or Sven, did you have a thought on that on the Turkey side? I mean, I think- Sven, do you Burrell, want to go first? Burrell, yeah, if you like, please. I mean, Burrell has been quite yeah. clear that this could be a topic of conversation with the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, it is definitely an issue for the EU because it's a territorial integrity of an EU member state uh, at stake eh? and, and we should show ourselves. I mean, that's something that you just cannot um, turn the other cheek on. If you can't even stand up for the territorial integrity uh, of all your member states. And this is something that, for once, we do have uh, clear and obvious leverage on through our e econom economic power. So I must say I'm a bit irritated uh, and surprised that uh, we don't push back much uh, harder uh, on, on, on the Eastern Mediterranean uh, issue, to be honest. Um, yeah. I would add that from how I look at this, the issue that we have with Turkey is not just with their behavior, but their behavior is induced and facilitated and even fed by our own behavior. Look at some of the geographical spaces that Turkey has um, addressed in ex its expansionist uh, pol foreign policies. Libya, Syria, Nagorno-Karabakh, all those areas are areas where the U.S. has refused, more or less, to, to continue playing a relevant role and where the EU has not even uh, thought about uh, going there and, and, and helping to fill that space. Um, the, the last example, striking example, was Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, the EU was completely absent from that, as were the, uh, the US, even though the US used to play a major role there. If we create those empty spaces, somebody will try to fill them. And uh, the, uh, Erdogan has uh, been very uh, successful in a way of uh, playing a, a ping pong with, with Putin on some of, some of these issues. And I think if, uh, if we want to rein him in, we have to take our responsibilities more seriously. Okay. Um, there were a couple of questions actually on, on more regulatory issues and above all about the sort of digital agenda and, and privacy policy and so on. How do you see this as, a, as an area where it's not been easy to work, but it's obviously quite, quite critical uh, if we're gonna build some sort of a, a sort of common approach to global regulatory issues. Uh, how do we how do we see that? Thoughts on that? Reiner, go ahead. The world is not waiting for us to sort this out. Um, standardization regulation in particular of advanced manufacturing technologies or IT is uh, going to be one of the um, the areas of competition where China is trying to play a very strong role. China uses the BRI partly to enforce its own national standards on those countries. China uses its participation in international organizations like the ITU to shape regulation according to its own political priorities. Uh, the question to the US and to the Europeans, I think should be, do we want to have a trifurcation of that race or a bifurcation? Um, will each of us be more successful if we um, somehow neglect the necessity to, to come to terms with each other? Or will we weaken each other uh, to a degree that uh, we will find a, a hegemony that neither uh, would prefer? If we start from that geopolitical point of view, then obviously I think we will address the issues differently than we, when we look just at the relationship as such. Okay. Any other thoughts on the digital front? If not, we've got lots of other interesting ones. Um, okay. Let me, let me go to one that I 
think is quite interesting. Uh, it is now kind of not, I suppose, formally part of the topic we have with us today, but uh, a question about uh, the UK and how a Biden administration in particular is going to approach the UK uh, in light of Brexit and, and the semi-deal that's been done. Uh, they've been quite critical so far. Uh, is there a special role for the UK? Is there uh, a place for US-EU dialogue about the UK, if I can put it that way? If I may, maybe. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you know, in the, in the first Brussels lockdown, I, I wrote a book. I mean, if you look up an academic, that, that's what they end up doing uh, about great powers and grand strategy. And kind of near the end, I realized I had said almost nothing about the UK. Uh, no, that is very, very anecdotal, obviously. But, but I mean, yeah, the UK is simply not not in that league of topics that we are discussing. Uh, we're in a world of great powers. The UK, on its own, is not a great power. We will now see with the new administration how the relationship between the EU and the US and and between um, the EU and NATO settles. And when it's settled, the UK will see where it fits, not the other way around. We're not going to start by asking where does the UK fit and, and build the rest around it. That's just not the reality of the power relationship. I mean, I don't say that with any schadenfreude. I, I actually really like the UK, even though successive British governments have done their best to, to dissuade me, but that will be the reality. I think. Thanks. Ellen, how does it look for Washington? So I... I um... So I do think that from a hard-nosed realist perspective, the Brits are a less important player and their strategy that somehow there'd be global UK when it was liberated from all the EU regulations and have special deals with the US and with China and, and be a great global actor. I think those are gonna be very hard to realize, perhaps not entirely the UK's fault, perhaps that was a, a the disruption of, of uh, COVID-19 uh, exacerbated the problem. But I wouldn't rule out the soft power dimension of US-UK relations. I mean, I do think that the, the, the phrase special relationship has been used and misused and abused over the years. Um, it's not the only special relationship the United States has, but the UK certainly wants to believe that there is still a transatlantic bond formed of, I mean, for goodness sakes, you know, Hamilton played in UK theaters and everybody loved it. So um, there is a, a, a special connection historically uh, and an affection for the UK and an ability for American companies to do business in the UK that will remain a, an American interest. Um, at least we still have the UK in the NATO alliance so that while Europeans see the UK as kind of, you know, truly the island that has separated from the continent, um, I think the US probably conceptually thinks about it a little bit differently. I do not expect this to be an early priority for the administration. I think they will restore friendly conversation, discourse with the British government, and I don't think they'll be taking any big action on this one way or the other. Okay. Um, I'm aware that we're getting close to our closing time. There are a lot of other questions. Some of them really overlap. So you'll forgive me maybe if I, if I come back to the three of you with, with a sort of opportunity to, to add whatever you might like at this point. But also I was thinking about something that, um, that I might, it would be good to have your thoughts on. I mean, arguably the Trump administration um, was not very good, maybe by design at linking up various aspects of policy uh, with real implications for Europe, the connections between trade policy, uh, security relationships, other things, migration, a whole set of things uh, that seem to cut against one another, uh, relationships with allies over trade issues or other things uh, that didn't seem compatible with security interests and vice versa. Um, you, one could expect from a, a more kind of traditional management of foreign policy, and that's probably what we will have now, uh, something that's more effective in that regard coming out of the NSC and other places. Um, would that be your expectation? Is it meaningful? Does it matter that we're not having a, you know, at least verbally a trade war uh, at the same time as we're trying to reinforce security ties across the Atlantic? Um, can Ellen, I come in ahead. on this? Yeah. 
Uh, Ian, so I'm really glad you asked that because one of the things that I think if you're watching closely that has emerged in how Biden has rolled out his appointments is this concept of integration and looking at problem sets as connected problem sets, not as not stovepiped. So when he's introduced his teams, he's made it very clear that they have to work you know, across bureaucratic boundaries and be more inclusive. So the fact that the White House is gonna have these Uber, uh, you know, senior directors for Asia, Kurt Campbell um, and um, uh, Brett McGurk for the Middle East and then senior directors under them. So you've got these holistic thinkers kind of at the top trying to see how the moving parts fit together. Uh, Climate again is cross-cutting every domestic and foreign policy agency, and that will force some a deeper way of working together. You know, our the size of our government is always creates these diseconomies of scale that you things get inefficient because there's too much specialization. Uh, but I think that Biden is very conscious and purposeful about trying to prevent that from happening. So um, let's see if he can make the system work in a more agile and uh, integrated way. How do you see it from the European side? And is Europe capable of, 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 of operating in that linked up way too? Uh, clearly it's not easy to do on this side of the Atlantic either. Well, I would come back to a remark that Sven made earlier when he said uh, that there is indeed a need in Washington to recognize how much the EU should be the partner. Uh, certainly the uh, Trump administration did not understand that by design. They, they didn't want to understand the positive role of the EU, even where it was demonstrated at Oculus, because uh, they, they followed a different ideology. But I hope that Biden will be different. I've read a long list of papers uh, trying to rewrite the transatlantic agenda from Berlin, uh, which always uh, sort of vacillated between writing a German-American agenda and a, an EU-American agenda. And um, I believe uh, that um, uh, it is also dependent on us um, um, where, what kind of transatlantic relationship we will focus on, uh, but it is certainly impossible to, to assume that uh, the um, integration of uh, the transatlantic uh, relationship uh, over all the different dimensions will be um, easily uh, implemented on, a, uh, uh, on the basis of the relationship between Washington and all the 27 or even the, the 10 most important uh, uh, capitals around Europe. So uh, I would assume um, that that it also depends on us to to uh, really signal that this is going to be a game in which the EU plays a centralizing and a coordinating role, notwithstanding the the different weight of different member states and notwithstanding their different priorities. But um, I found it encouraging in that regard that the initial offer from the European side to the incoming uh, administration for strong cooperation came from Brussels. It didn't come from Berlin, didn't come from Paris, it came from Brussels. That's the right approach. Reiner, yeah. thank you. Sven, go to, ahead. To, to, to pick up uh, ex exactly from there, I mean, I think the EU conceptually actually has a pretty good um, idea of its, of its agenda. If you look at the um, 2016 global strategy, it has five priorities, you know, protect Europe itself, stabilize the neighborhood, create an instrument for power projection, uh, stabilize geopolitically contested regions, um, and, and, and revive multilateralism. That's still the agenda uh, today, right? I would add to that as a horizontal factor, the increased rivalry between the great powers that plays on all of this. Uh, but, but, but have we done that, right? Um, so we're, we're quite good in a way at crafting strategies and member states are even willing to sign up to it, but maybe they willingly sign up to it because they know they have no intention of that actually letting steering their national foreign policy. So uh, on our side, it's in a way quite possible in Brussels to craft a holistic uh, view, um, but certainly in, in international politics, it's still the national capitals that, that play the leading role. And yeah, that, I mean, how to say, 
that is as much a rear guard action as global Britain is a rear guard action. That, that is being blind for the reality of, of great power politics, I, I'm afraid. Thanks. Ian, I, I think there's a point of tension that we could see from Obama through Trump and perhaps into the Biden administration over uh, how do we recalibrate American leadership? And here, what I'm getting to here is greater reliance on regions that regional organizations should uh, take more responsibility, if you will. I, I believe that was implicit in how Trump looked at the Middle East. I think the Middle Easterners didn't quite grasp this at the beginning, that he was you know, smothering them with, uh, with love and but basically saying over to you to deal with Iran. Um, he wasn't necessarily saying that we're going to come in as the knight on shining armor and do it all, take care of this problem for you. You need to do it yourself. So if I could extend that concept of greater respect for regional capabilities, um, perhaps that will extend uh, to be in a new kind of baseline assumption that we make in how we interact with the EU, that we want the EU to be stronger. That's obviously in the Cold War, that was always an, an undertow of ambivalence on the US part of whether we wanted greater regional uh, capability, but maybe we're in a new era now, whereas the US tries to a, a little bit recalibrate primacy versus, you know, we're just another great power or we're no longer the single superpower. Uh, there's, it, it does get you to the logic of why, uh, you know, friendly regions should be comfortable, the U.S. should be comfortable with regions taking, setting their own agenda and uh, taking more responsibility. Ellen, thank you. Um, you know, it won't surprise any of you for someone from GMF to say this, but especially in your last remarks, you hear very much, I think, uh, you know, uh, the importance of the US rediscovering its stake in what Americans like to call the European project. Uh, it's that terminology isn't often used here, but it's code for the EU and where it's going. And that, that has been in sort of short supply in recent years. I think we probably all agree, uh, at least a bit of that thinking is definitely coming back, even though all of these issues we've been talking about are not, not necessarily going to be easy ones to solve. Thanks to all three of you for joining us for the really extraordinary conversation, a very open one, very lively one. My apologies to a lot of the people who sent in questions. It's really impossible to get to them all with 300 people on the line, uh, but we certainly spurred a lot of debate on the sidebar, which is, which is part of the purpose. Uh, let me thank again, Egmont. Uh, it's really been a pleasure to put this together with you, Sven. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Reinhard, Ellen, Sven, again, uh, great to have you with us. Uh, look forward to having you with us again soon. Uh, thanks to all of you who joined us. Uh, for those who might have missed the conversation and want to see it, it will be available on GMF's YouTube channel. Um, and let me just finally thank my colleagues, Louise and Jessica and William, uh, for making all of this happen. Uh, thank you all for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again at GMF. Thank you, Ian. Good afternoon. Cheers. Take Bye. care.